This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. In today's special edition of World Inside, China's modernization and the world. China pulls out all the stops in pursuing its own modernization toward prosperity for all. Fresh from this year's political season, the two sessions, what's the course and strategy to better steer the whole nation toward the ultra-modern digital age? How can China reach modernization step by step? A strong panel of political figures and scholars helps spell it out. Hello and welcome to World Inside. I'm Tian Wei. Chinese modernization is a hot topic both at home and abroad amid this year's two sessions. Citing a progress report delivered to the 20 CPC National Congress, Chinese President Xi Jinping said Chinese modernization means big benefits for a huge population and common prosperity for all. The report touched on peaceful development with advances in living standards, culture and ethics. That's on top of pursuing harmony between humanity and nature. One of the defining features, common prosperity for all, is not only essential to socialism, but a key measure in nation's socioeconomic plan. From GDP growth targets, development models, to microeconomic policies, the two sessions have mapped out steps toward Chinese modernization and high-quality growth. China's efforts to meet the people's aspirations for a better life also mean opportunities for the rest of the world. On this, we present a special TV forum, Chinese Modernization and the World. We invite scholars from China and around the world to share their thoughts on common prosperity as part of China's modernization. Welcome, everyone. From Brazil, Alessandro de Guerra, former Minister of Development, Industry, and Foreign Trade. From Australia, Jeffrey Hawker, Head of Politics and International Relations with Macquarie University. From the UK, John Ross, Senior Fellow at the Chongyang Institute for Financial Studies with Renmin University of China. From Malaysia, Peter Chang, Deputy Director of the Institute of Chinese Studies from the University of Malaya. From the U.S., Michael Powers, Zurich Insurance Group Chair Professor with the School of Economics and Management with Tsinghua University. And from China, last but not least, Dr. Li Yong, Chief Researcher at DNC Think Tank. Gentlemen, welcome to the program. Why do you see China keep on emphasizing on common prosperity. It is once again being listed as one of the important goals when China talks about Chinese-style modernization. Let me go to uh, Dr. Li first uh, from China's perspective briefly. Um, I think this is really the founding purpose and vision of the uh, Communist Party. And it is determined uh, by the uh, socialist uh, so, uh socialist society with Chinese characteristics. And it is an important part of, uh, of the uh, Communist Party leg uh, legitimacy uh, to uh, lead Chinese people towards the uh, goal of common prosperity. Mm. Professor Powers, your interpretation. I think that first of all, um, as the, the, the country has grown over um, the past 40, 45 years, the economy has developed. Um, there has been a tremendous increase in wealth. Not everyone has shared equally in that wealth. And as we go forward, it's very important to make sure that um, all sectors, um, the urban individuals, the agricultural um, citizens and so forth, share uh, in economic equity um, with the development of the country. Mm. Mr. Chen, of course, uh, this slogan was raised decades ago when Common Prosperity Prosperity was also mentioned even back in the 1950s. But of course, this time is very different in terms of time and in terms of essence. 
Well, I remember about 40 years ago when things have been opened up China, he says that we got to get, allow some people to get rich first. And 40 years down the road, I think China has reached that moment where they feel that we are ready to allow everyone to get rich together. And I think it is important that China must bring the rest of the country along in this wealth generation and, and prosperity era. For me, for us in Malaysia, Southeast Asia, the common prosperity uh, slogan resonate with us because we are from the global South. We do see ourselves as lesser developed. So there is a global dimension to this message whenever we hear this, that this common prosperity has an international appeal as well, mm -hmm. that this is for us as well in Southeast Asia, that we, that we could be part of the, the common prosperity story. <clears throat> Of course, Brazil is also uh, developing an emerging economy. Uh, doc, uh, Minister, Mr. Minister Dexera. Yes, uh, basically, Chen Wen, I, I understand Como prosperity as the qualification of the concept of development for China. When you're talking about common prosperity, we are talking much more than just generation and distribution of wealth. We are talking about better education system, better health system, the better. That's why we have a very deep connection in the view of the Communist Party with the Chinese modernization, because we need to get everybody at the same level in terms of development. So that's to me is the qualification of the way, the path that China chooses to develop. Mm. Dr. Ross, Mr. Ross? Well, I, I think common prosperity corresponds to two things. One is I'm, I'm morally in favor of it. I think all human beings should benefit from development, but it's also economically rational. I mean, if yeah. you want to see what is irrational about excessive inequality, look at the United States at the present time. You have deep political disorder, but you also have a situation in which the share of the economy going to the profits uh, in profits has been increasing and the percentage of the economy that's going to investment has actually been falling, uh, which means that a large amount of this new wealth is being used for things which are not productive at all from the point of view of society. So common prosperity is good from the point of view of development of human beings, but it's also economically rational. Mr. Geoffrey Hawker, Professor Hawker. Sure. Well, there was a famous saying once that uh, politics is about who gets what, when, how. And that often points to a material base, which I think is what we're talking about. But of course, thinkers from Marx across the liberal thinkers have all espoused something like material equality for all. But we know well in societies I could name, like my own, uh, that's very, very far from the truth. And in fact, Often talking about it is just disguises the fact that inequality is rampant. Um, you know, there are political freedoms, but economic inequality. So I think when China puts on the table the sincere demonstration that it's going to really make every effort to share prosperity across the whole nation, then that's a very, very powerful message. And, and not just for the third world, I, I'd certainly agree with that, but it's of course a very powerful uh, uh, lesson, if it can be achieved right. for, for nations in the right. first world. Yeah. You did ask that important question, if it can be achieved. Now, the question now is how? Uh, we have seen China, uh, for example, Mr. Ross, eradicate extreme poverty. And yet, of course, with the economic challenges as a result of years of the pandemic and also evolving international situation, China now is uh, making utmost effort trying to maintain the fact that extreme poverty uh, has been uh, uh, eradicated. But on the other hand, even during the government work report, at the two sessions this year, uh, China indicated it needs to make efforts to make sure to prevent the, uh, the coming back of extreme poverty in some places. So uh, do you see eradicating extreme poverty as the starting point? Uh, what, is about, what about the question of how? 
Well, yes, the question of eliminating extreme poverty is crucial. I mean, you can't possibly have common prosperity if a portion of the population is living in poverty. And one of the most um, good things, the most inspiring things about China, is we know from the development of all societies that um, you, although economic growth is the foundation for improving living standards, some people get left behind from this because they it may be because they're in inaccessible yeah. parts of the country. They may have social inequalities and others, and these have to be addressed consciously. And this is one of the fundamentally good things that China's done. There was a big mobilization involving in, in the end millions of people to deal with the most difficult areas of poverty. And it was done totally consciously. And yes, this is a key part of common prosperity. There's also average living standards, mm. but certainly making sure nobody's in poverty is key. Mm. Dr. Chang, what about for developing countries at this moment uh, uh, to reduce poverty and to make sure everybody has a better chance of employment and income is such a hard task for everyone, especially for the developing world. Well, in Malaysia, the uh, wealth gap here is both geographical and demographic. We have the coastal and urban rural sort of divide. And then there's also a wealth gap between the different races as well. So it is a kind of complicated uh, uh, challenge that we have. And in order to deal with that, we need to have very comprehensive and very, very strategic kind of uh, investment and economic policy. And for us in Malaysia, we really need to bring the economic development and momentum to the rural parts of the country. And we also need to have economic policy that makes sure that every uh, group demographic within a country is given a fair chance mm -hmm. to have uh, social economic mobility. So those are the challenges that we face, and we feel that China could play a part in it. Uh, the Belt and Road Initiative, for example, has really generated some momentum for us. Uh, the East Coast yeah. Rail Link that we had here in Malaysia has built the rail link that links the, to where the Klang Valley, where our economic center is, to our East Coast part. So that kind of effort right. could really help us to narrow the gap between the urban and the rural so economic divide, I think. China earlier has been warned by the fact that uh, uh, the Gini coefficient uh, uh, rate of China has been reaching to a certain extent. So, uh, but now it seems that things are uh, getting better with the latest moves of uh, eradicating extreme poverty. But uh, how do you see uh, things are at this time when economies everywhere is struggling. Uh, so what about for China, that question, how? I, I think that uh, I would make a distinction between the, um, the impetus behind poverty alleviation, which I think is primarily moral, ethical, economic equity, um, and common prosperity, which is partially, of course, um, moral and involves economic equity but also um, is a way to take advantage of the human capital that exists throughout the country. Um, and, and in particular, when we're talking about um, bringing areas such as the rural, the agricultural areas into the, the um, national network, I think it's, it's a matter of economic common sense, um, economic opportunity for everyone to take advantage of the people, the talents that are in those parts of the country. So it's not just um, trying to subsidize them or uh, tax others and make wealth transfers uh, to share uh, economic, uh, e economic benefits, but it's, it's rather to bring them in and, and make them participants in the, the economy, which is a strength that China has that many other countries don't have. Let me move on, uh, gentlemen, to another important aspect of Chaman Prosperity. The Belt and Road Initiative, the Global uh, Development Initiative, uh, the Human Community of Shared Future, uh, and also the shared uh, uh, values uh, uh, of human beings. All these are uh, global visions that China put forward in recent years. How do you see you know, the issue of common prosperity uh, as part of Chinese modernization, uh, will be interacting 
with the uh, global uh, movement or the global efforts, despite difficulties today, to uh, bring better life to everyone. Well, uh, as I suggested before, I do believe that this 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 strategy, this approach, will will work. Um, it is a long term effort, um, and I, I believe it is something that well, China, China will be able to showcase as a model, and other countries will be able to follow this model. Again, what I what I want to emphasize is that the the significance of it is that um, large numbers of people who have been left out. Um, who have had a, a, a smaller share of the, the growth and in, in, in the prosperity over the past four decades um, will not just be given more more money through through transfers, but will become an integral part of the economy. And I think that there are many countries around the world that could benefit from that, not just um, not just developing countries. Um, I believe that many of the, the most developed countries, um, have a problem today. They, they, there is disagreement on how to deal with many of the, these questions of human values that you, that you referenced. Um, and quite often, even the more progressive elements in those societies uh, simply see um, the, the redistribution of wealth, the, the, the subsidies, without preparing people to, um, for the challenges of the future, without educating them. Um, I think that, that these countries, the United States included, could learn from uh, this type of approach. Mr. Ross? Yes, I, I think the, the fundamental thing which is in, involved in this thing is that China has got a vision of what type of society that it's um, trying to create. And it doesn't base itself on purely formal criteria, we have a narrow range of political um, goals, because uh, these are not real. I, I often use the example, but I mean, for example, if the life expectancy of a Chinese woman is um, almost 10 years longer than the life expectancy of an Indian woman, yet some people claim that the Indian woman's human rights are better. And this is just nonsense if you look at the point of the real world. What China's concerned with, therefore, is the all-round development of people. Certainly the economy is the basis of this, but also their social development, health, education, leisure activities, the ability to pursue uh, their cultural activities, and all these types of aspects are aspects of uh, common prosperity. And, and these are all things which China has put in place so uh, Dr. Chen, earlier you indicated about uh, the global uh, impacts that some of the Chinese initiatives could have and also help in supporting common prosperity, not only in China, but also uh, in other parts of the world. Tell me more about your thoughts on that point. If I can allow me to return to the BRI, because we will be celebrating 10th sure. anniversary of Please. BRI. And I think BRI has been a very critical role in our part of in our parts of the world, Southeast Asia and ASEAN, in terms of achieving some kind of our own version of the common prosperity. Uh, BRI is going to morph into digital BRI, sustainable BRI, uh, health zero BRI. And these are all mechanisms that will help us to develop, to bring social economic uplift to parts of our country that needs that kind of uh, investment. President Xi has mentioned mm -hmm. about much more people-focused investment, less emphasis on vanity projects. And here in Malaysia, we need that. We need more infrastructure. We need more uh, infrastructure that meets the common man's needs rather than upper middle class or the wealthy's uh, new uh, uh, lifestyle with very fleshy condominiums and things like that. So we want to go back to the basics. And if we go back to the basics and meet the needs of the common man, then we are one step closer to achieving this vision mm. of a common prosperity in our part of the world. Mm. Professor Hawker? Yes, I, I, I believe we're taking the correct approach in a way in answering the previous question. I guess that's why we, you know, this linkage follows that the long term common prosperity in China itself depends on, you know, internal matters, education, open, uh, honest government and so forth. But but also it's reciprocal with China in the world and what it's doing and the difference it's making and the respect it engenders and the changes that happen in other societies, taking note of, of Chinese, um, obviously, Belt and Road, but many other things too, as other 
we've just touched on. And that it's that complementarity that seems to me to be absolutely critical. And that is a very long-term thing, but it's manifest. We can see it. And it makes perfect sense, it seems to me, as not mm. just for China, but for the others. I mean, my own interest in Africa, of course, I look at the people and nations of Africa and, you know, I, I see how important it is really in the post-colonial era. Dr. Lee? Yes, I think uh, the uh, uh, China's effort to uh, achieve common pr prosperity is uh, uh, is going to provide a kind of experience for other countries to reference, uh, not really to copy. BRI is an effort to really to help countries, uh, mostly uh, from global south, you know, to resolve their uh, uh, bottlenecks, for example, in their infrastructure, power supply, et cetera, et cetera. And secondly, I think the uh, BRI um, is actually a network and that is going to, uh, to have a kind of ongoing con connectivity between China and all the participating countries. And uh, the connectivity will allow countries to continue to channel uh, dynamism in their own effort uh, to achieve their common prosperity. I think that is the right. key uh, significance of a BRI and China's effort to develop its own common prosperity. The world is getting ever more complicated, the geopolitics and geopolitical divide, ideological divide, uh, disruption in global supply chains. Uh, these are not the danger. These have become realities. And as a result of that, how much do you see that we all have to come across, we all have to overcome in order to uh, achieve common prosperity for all? How much danger is there geopolitical competition would derail uh, some of the most important goals that we set for ourselves and we set for all? Uh, I think it's clear what you said in terms of message. Remember that uh, recently the Secretary General of the United Nations mentioned that none of the 17 Sustainable Development Goals has been achieving or near to be achieved. So my point here very briefly is to say that the issues that we are dealing with, they are global issues. There is only one a out of this is cooperation, not competition. Issues that we are facing, we can see the COVID-19, if we don't cooperate, probably we didn't have the vaccine until now. The future issues like climate change, poverty reduction, uh, floods and things like that, the disasters, they need cooperation. They don't need mm -hmm. any more competition. So that's my point. And that's where China comes to hand because China is setting up an agenda for cooperation and not competition. Mr. Ross. Well, yes, I think there's a real danger that fundamentally because the United States is trying to do something which is impossible. Um, it's trying to be a country of less than 350 million people, which um, is allowed to dictate to the rest of the world what they do. But there's 1.4 billion people in China. There's 1.4 billion people in India. There's more than a billion people in Africa. There's 700 million people in Europe. And they're not going to be, uh, the idea that they're going to be ruled by 350 million people won't work. And therefore, this is very dangerous because the danger is the United States will try to use military or other means to maintain the situation. So I'm optimistic on the long run because I think humanity will overcome this, but I think there are very considerable risks in the short term coming from the present policies of the United States. Dr. Chen, how worried are you that geopolitical competition and even rivalry could derail uh, important goals like uh, common prosperity for all, not only in this part of the world, but also elsewhere as well? We are really concerned that conflict uh, sort of open conflict will occur. And we just feel very concerned that this could escalate into something that will be very detrimental for us and for the world. So that's why ASEAN as a whole simply do, do not want to take sides right now. We do not want to take sides in this great power rivalry, but we do want to take the sides of peace over war. We want to continue to reiterate our call for both sides to come to the table and to find a peaceful sort of a solution to the current very tense situation that we are in. Right. 
Of course, in China's uh, latest description about what Chinese modernization is, common prosperity is one, another characteristics is peaceful development. Uh, Professor Powers, uh, your thoughts on how important it is that we are not blurred uh, by uh, some of the uh, disconnecting attempts, but rather focusing on the common prosperity for all in hopefully in all parts of the world? Well, I think in, in the past few years, globalism has taken a, a few very difficult hits. Um, there is the, the trade tension, trade war uh, between China and the United States. There's the COVID epidemic. Um, there are the supply chain disruptions that you indicated. There's the military conflict going on um, as we speak. So I, I think that it's incredibly important for all nations in the world to, to try to, to stay away, to move back from unilateralism, uh, to try mm -hmm. to work with the, the conventional organizations, uh, the World Trade Organization, the United Nations, and so forth. Um, there was a, a, a comments about competition and cooperation. Um, I don't think that those two things are necessarily inimical to one another. Um, I think that there, there are times we need competition. I think the competition makes us all better, especially when it has to do with improving economic products, for example. But when it comes to maintaining peace in the world, um, the, the free travel across the oceans, the um, reduction of tension, the reduction of poverty, um, I think in those cases, we definitely need uh, to have more leadership from various nations and um, I, th I think in this way that um, China is playing a very important role today. I think you know, uh, the current situation is going to have a kind of a short-term impact because uh, generally uh, people will eventually uh, uh, reach a kind of awakening day, uh, finding out that nobody really wants uh, kind of a global alienation, you know, loss of community, unhappiness, and so on and so forth. And all the human activities should be focusing on uh, creating uh, unity and common prosperity. And of course, you know, that will require positive contribution in addition to cooperation. Mm. Gentlemen, thank you so much for your insights and also your sharing with us your thoughts on common prosperity as part of China's drive for Chinese modernization. Appreciate it. All the best. And that's all the time we have for today's program. On behalf of the team, thanks for watching. Bye for now.